And the Sanhedrin was the official Jewish authority. They had um, authority over the temple and the area around the temple. And so the Sanhedrin would have been presided over by the high priest, this really high and dignified guy. And you can imagine that the Sanhedrin was much like the Supreme Court and the Senate um, for, for the Jewish people all combined into one. And so the Sanhedrin convened and they were kind of, you can imagine, seated on high. And Peter and John were brought down before them and they were questioned. And as Peter and John were questioned, they were so filled with the Holy Spirit that they did not quake and they didn't ache. They stood there flat-footed and made a strong and powerful defense about what had happened and what they were about. They said almost immediately that, you know, if you've brought us here because you think we've done something evil, that's ridiculous. Look at the guy. He's walking. We did something good. And if you want to know by what power or what authority we did this, we did this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead. Now, the Sanhedrin had a problem. They were tongue-tied, for one, because these guys were so powerful and eloquent, and they didn't see it coming. They couldn't refute what they had to say. They could not um, undermine their teaching. They had unimpeachable words. They had... Um, undeniable power through the lame man who was walking and they also had a problem in that this guy they say that was crucified uh, they couldn't find the body as a matter of fact I would imagine as they sent their investigators out to look for the body of Jesus all they heard was yeah I saw him but he was kind of like walking around and stuff actually when I saw him he was like you know going to heaven and so they had a problem and, and they did not know what to do if they held on to the men, they would have turned them into martyrs. They had, they had the, the difficulty of perhaps turning the mob into a riot. If they, uh, if they let them go, they were almost, you know, validating their movement. So they did not know what to do. So finally they decided to warn them, but to let them go. And so they let them go with a warning. They said to them, you can leave, but you have to quit teaching and preaching in the name of Jesus. To which these guys, so bold and so filled with the Holy Spirit, looked right back at them and said, you know, you can decide for yourself what is right or wrong. Uh, to listen to you or to listen to God. But I can't, we can tell you this, we cannot help. We are absolutely compelled. It absolutely just flows out of us. We must speak about everything that we've heard and we've seen. And so despite being kind of defiant in that regard, they let them go, and that's where we pick up the scene today. And I say that all together. This was all happening very, very quick, quickly. It was very fluid. It was an unbelievable movement. It, get, it makes me excited because that's how God can move through us, you know. I know we don't believe that, but God could come upon us with power by his Holy Spirit and do something extraordinary and add numbers to us daily of those who are being saved. If that power existed then, then it can exist now as well. I think the only thing missing is certainly not the will of God, but perhaps the will of us as humans um, to give ourselves to such a movement. Nonetheless, um, around this time, they were let go, and that's where the passage picks up today. After they were released, um, they went back to their people, probably to the other apostles and, and kind of the core of the movement that they had just recently been a huge part of starting. In verse 23, where we pick up, it says this. It says on their release... Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Now, you have to imagine, they didn't just say what they had said to them. Um, they also have had to say what they said back to, to the Sanhedrin, right? Uh, it could not have, they retold the story. They recounted the events. And you have to think there was some level of enthusiasm uh, because this was such a powerful and wonderful encounter, and the fact that they were standing there was the biggest miracle they, they could have ever imagined. I'm sure that when they were arrested and brought be before the Sanhedrin, they probably thought that was it for them. The last time that happened, the guy, you know, was crucified. And so they were probably excited that they had the courage to stand up to the Sanhedrin, and they were probably marveling at the power of God um, through whom uh, they were released. I can imagine Peter standing before the people, I'm just guessing, and, and saying, you're, you're never going to believe what happened. Uh, remember how, like, just about a month ago, um, I was this huge coward? And uh, first of all, I didn't understand the cross, that Jesus had to die on the cross. I said, if anybody nails you to a cross, I'm going to kill him. Well, then they nailed him to the cross, and I didn't kill anybody because he was supposed to be nailed to the cross. And, oh, by the way, I was kind of afraid. 
And you remember how I denied Christ three times and ran away in shame? Well, not anymore. Um, something in my character has changed. Uh, the same boldness you saw come in me um, that allowed me to preach Christ to the masses remained in me as I stood before the Sanhedrin. And instead of being intimidated, I was filled with great power and eloquence again um, to make a strong defense for Christ. Uh, I can imagine him, and look, they had to have these conversations. There's no way they didn't. Like, just go here with me. I can imagine him laughing almost gleefully, kind of silly, almost just kind of with this clever laughter, saying, I didn't even know I knew that. Uh, it's like when I went to seminary. You've heard me tell this story before. I love to brag about this. And I took a historical theology exam, and I literally didn't have time to study. And I knew I was called to seminary, so I sat down for the exam. And this wasn't an exam where, like, if you had some kind of philosophical idea, you could kind of fudge it. It was names and dates, and, and they were none of them that I'd ever seen before. And it was fill in the blank. It wasn't even multiple guests, right? And I'm, this is a true story. I sat for this exam. This only, only happened once. If I had kept trying it, I would have failed. And God gave me the, I'm sure that the Holy Spirit, the, the names and the dates appeared in my mind and I wrote them down. And I turned it in and I thought, wow, that's going to be interesting. <laughs> and I made 100%. God, I cheated in seminary with the aid of the Holy Spirit. But when you're in seminary, they don't care. If God gives you the answers, they're like, that's cool with us. And I, I believe that Peter had this moment. I mean, the way he was pivoting off of Old Testament Scripture and explaining it with such clarity, his ability to speak with eloquence and power, he was like, I didn't even know that I knew this. And conditions um, that just not that many days ago, I mean, I haven't had time to go through this big character development and self-improvement process. Things that I didn't have a few days ago, I have just in multitude now it's because what I contain is not my own knowledge I contain God and I have the knowledge of God and on a need-to-know basis he puts stuff through me and conditions that created my worst hour have now created my finest hour and John you know was right there along with him and that was their moment and that's what they came back and they recounted to the people and it got them all very very excited um, because they understood intuitively by the Holy Spirit that also existed in them that the way God worked through Peter and John, um, he intended to work through them. And what I submit to you today is the way God worked through Peter and John and the way God worked through the early church is exactly how he intends to work through us as well. Uh, they were an example and a symbol of what was to come for the New Testament body, and it's something that we can anticipate as well. Uh, the response of the early believers was this. It says that when they heard this, when the people, the core, anywhere between, I don't know, 100 and the 20,000, I don't know how many people they went back to. When they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. I love that they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Um, as we're about to read through this entire passage, a very short one today, um, individuals are lifting up their hearts to God. Um, they're giving their mind over to God. They're giving their hearts over to God. They're giving their lives over to God. And individuals are coming before God. But when we read the language here, it's as if they were one person. And so the entire group goes before God. And I'm sure there were spokesmen and people speaking out loud as a pastor might speak for his congregation. But they were in one heart and they were in one mind and they spoke with one voice together in, in great unity before God. Um, saying and thinking the same thing. Nobody was ahead of anybody. Nobody was teaching one person and somebody else was left out. As it came out of one person's mouth, uh, the Spirit immediately revealed it to the congregation. And indeed, that's the way it should be in the New Testament church. The Spirit of God that is in me is in you. It was prophesied um, that, that the least um, in the church, the least would be the greatest, but it also was prophesied um, that no one will teach their neighbor to know God because they will all know me from the least to the greatest. Uh, they all had this um, enlightenment from the Spirit. When Peter and John retold the story, they all had the same reaction. Um, though they had different personalities and they would be gifted by God in different ways, um, they all had this wonderful revelation. And so they spoke and they prayed together. Uh, they began by saying, Sovereign Lord, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. 
Now, this is a, this is a very common um, liturgical prayer or a way to begin a prayer. Uh, you see um, something very similar to this in many places in the Old Testament. And, and indeed, this um, group of people, primarily Jewish, I would say at this point, uh, would be very familiar with this language. And so it was almost a liturgical approach to God. And what's interesting to me is um, that they were inspired by the Spirit of God to begin their prayer with this very prayerful liturgy. Um, but I think for some of them, um, they were saying it and understanding it uh, in a way that was fresh for the very first time. Uh, for example, for years and years and years, um, I, I grew up in the Episcopal Church, and for years and years and years, um, I stood with the congregation as we read the Nicene Creed. And for years and years and years, I had it memorized, and it was etched in my mind, though it was not yet etched in my heart. And for years and years and years, it was this empty religious thing that I did over and over and over again. And then one day, I fell in love with Jesus Christ. And theologically, but spiritually, his blood covered me, and his Holy Spirit filled me. And then I went back and read um, the liturgy, the, the, the lyrics of that creed, um, that I'd read for years and years and years, and, and all of a sudden, it, I was in a place where I could basically weep because uh, w what I had been seeing for years and years, um, now I was beginning to perceive. And what I had heard for years and years, I was now beginning to understand. And so this congregation, I imagine, presided over by one of the apostles, uh, really whoever led it was insignificant. What was significant was that they were all in one spirit and that God by his spirit was leading it. They, they, they say a liturgy that they were very familiar with, but probably in a way that they never had before. Uh, they were recognizing, um, as it is appropriate in any prayer, um, the authority and the power and the omniscience and the omnipresence of God. They were recognizing that this Jesus that they had walked with and taught with and become so familiar with, um, he was the Lord of all the universe. Uh, that he wasn't just a man who spoke words, he was the Word made flesh, the Word, the Logos that spoke the universe into existence. They were seeing it so clearly for the first time. The authority of God had never been so real to them. And they had this juxtaposition. They had this weird situation where they were so clear about the purity and the holiness and the power and the vitality um, of the authority of God as exemplified through Jesus and as now has landed on them by the Holy Spirit. And they, had that, they had that living example of the authority and the greatness of God. And they, next to the juxtaposition um, of the empty shirts of the high priests and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and, and all the religious leaders who, ha who really had no authority at all and so for years and years and years um, they recognized that there was a secular authority of the Roman government and they knew that they were defunct but they had to think well even though we don't understand it and even though it kind of bores us and even though it seems kind of you know I don't know draconian to us the high priest the Sanhedrin these religious people we kind of trust their authority but now they're having their own moment with God where they're recognizing wait a minute um, the authority of God um, not only exceeds the authority of these men who are apparently supposedly anointed by God, but now we're seeing clearly through our interaction with them, through our persecution um, by them, that their authority and God's authority are two different things. Uh, their authority, though, biblically, in, in a sense, the offices of their authority are legitimate. Um, the men who occupy those offices are not anointed, and this isn't real. And we, and we just had a couple of our guys that we used to go fishing with um, who have now been lit up with the authority of God go before the so-called uh, religious authority of our, of, of our nation and our culture. And we're beginning to see that they are not the same thing. And so they begin their prayer with a formal liturgy that ironically, this is so complicated but wonderful, that probably they were taught by this group. And they're recognizing as legitimate as this, as this prayer is, as wonderful and truthful as the words are, um, the truth about God is not coming through them. And, and, and these guys over here um, are not the ones. And so they begin their prayer with a liturgy, and then they quickly pivot um, to Psalm 2. 
a psalm of, of David, of King David. And they recognize the authority of the sovereign Lord in control of all things. They recognize that he is creator. He created them and all the things around them. If he is author, therefore he has authority. People say, why should we listen to God? Why should we listen to Jesus? Why should we submit to God's word? Why should we submit to God's law? Well, because he's the author of creation. Therefore, he's the authority over creation. He made us. He knows how we were made. When we submit to him, we do what is good for ourselves and what is glorifying to him. And they're recognizing that. And after they say that, they go on to say and recognize from Psalm 2, they're having this collective moment of revelation. I would have loved to have been there to see how it kind of all played out, but they were all having it. As I pray to God, we are all having it here today. They said, you spoke by the Holy Spirit. First, they interpret what was happening in the Psalm that they're about to quote, right? They said, you spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant and our father, David. They don't call him King David because they recognize when he was writing Psalm 2, he was actually a prophet at that moment. And they're saying, okay, we remember this psalm. For some reason, it is clear to us as ever. It was like me cheating on that test in historical, historical theology. It was made clear to them for the moment. Maybe they opened the parchment, maybe they didn't. And they began to read it. But more than that, they, more than reading it, uh, they began to understand it and perceive it. Remember, Jesus said, you're ever seeing but never perceiving. You're ever hearing but never understanding. That was the religious cycle um, of the Jews and Christians and, and any religious people through history over and over again. But the moment the Holy Spirit comes in, it gives us the ability to look intently to God's word and to understand it. And so they're seeing it for the first time, even though they've seen it many times. And they're interpreting that, wait a minute, this isn't just poetry. This isn't just history. This isn't just a mood that David was in. This is prophecy. This is the same Holy Spirit that is alive in me now that was alive upon him then that was writing this. And so they recognize that this was prophetic and they recognize that it applies not just to what was going on around David thousands of years or hundreds of years ago, but what was happening with them right now. And they begin to quote it. They say, why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? They recognize that this passage, this scripture, is explaining what we're experiencing, the persecution we're experiencing right now. Uh, you would think that if you fell in love with God more than ever before and knew him more greatly than ever before, then your religious authorities would pat you on the back and, and you know, celebrate with you. And now they're seeing why that's not the case. Why do the nations rage and the people plot in vain? They go on to quote, The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. And then they stop and they interpret, okay, what did David mean by that? Well, you know, the ancient Hebrew tradition of that um, interpretation would be that, 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 that the Lord um, would, be, would be Yahweh, would be God. And as anointed one, and there's no capitals here, so there's, no necessar there's not necessarily any deity assigned to the anointed one. Uh, t traditionally, they would have said, why do the nations battle against Yahweh uh, against King David, his anointed servant, and Israel, his anointed nation, which would not have entirely been untrue, right? I mean, prophecy is a dynamic thing, but it is made more true in the time of Christ. And what they're saying is, hey, that may have been true kind of for a moment, but what, but what this really means, and we now have this insight from the Holy Spirit, is why do the nations, including our own nation, rage and band together against the Lord the Father, Yahweh, His Son, the Anointed One, Jesus, and all who are anointed in His name, the body of Christ as well. Ah, this makes sense. Now we see this strange alliance between the Romans and the Jews. Mortal enemies, one subjugated to the other. But in this one person, Jesus, they found a way to come together because whether they knew it or not, maybe they do now, up until that time, though they fought with each other, they were actually playing for the wrong team, both of them. And it, and it goes on to interpret it. They say, indeed, Herod and Pontius Pilate met together with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, uh, the Jews and the Gentiles, the Roman leaders with the Jewish leaders, Roman authority with Hebrew authority came together to conspire against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed. And Jesus told us, as they did with him, they'll do with us as well. We get it. We understand what's happening. 
So critically important when we're being persecuted. So incredibly important that when we're going through a difficult time that we properly interpret it. So many people think God is mad at them when probably he's never been so proud. Uh, The Apostle Paul said, why do you act like uh, you shouldn't be persecuted? He said, as if something strange was happening to you. Like, this is the deal, man. If you follow hard after God in a world that has turned away from God, you're going to be persecuted. That's just the way it goes. Count the cost. And, and they were beginning to understand it. They were opening up the Old Testament Scripture, applying it to themselves, and they were understanding. They were feeding themselves. They were encouraging themselves by the power of God's Word. The, the Bible teaches us that Herod and Pilate, um, up until the time of Jesus, were mortal enemies, but they became friends over this idea of killing Jesus. Uh, nothing like a common enemy to make friends. In this case, enemies became friends because of their equal concern about Jesus. Jesus threatened Roman authority because he was such a powerful political leader, even though he didn't try to be. And he most certainly warred against the authority of the religious Jews because the way he interpreted Scripture and, and brought God's grace into the lives of people um, unearthed or undid their ability to control and manipulate the masses. And so they're having this revelation. And they're going, whoa, whoa. Now, this is an important part. Everything so far was just kind of important. Because what was so staggering to them, and I'm convinced that this is true, and I hope we're kind of staggered by this as well. What was so staggering to them was was this. If God is exalted and on high, the Father, and his Son, Jesus Christ, there's no daylight in between them. They're one and the same. Uh, The Son is the radiance of the Father's glory and the exact representation of His being. So if the Father Yahweh, our God, is on high, His Son Jesus Christ is now seated at His right hand, and we're transported into and have that authority transported to us by the power of the Holy Spirit. If that authority is existing and it's on high, and there's no way that we can be saved, there's no way we can be right with God, there's no righteousness, there's nothing good, there's nothing more important, there's nothing more worthy on planet Earth. If that is true as they have already prayed. And our existing authority, everything we've ever known for authority and oversight and protection and covering is defunct. And God has chosen for whatever reason to take the anointing off the old offices and to place them instead upon us, then then we have a huge responsibility to the world. Got it? When, When... when our president and Congress and Supreme Court and all the authority things that we know around us, when the church centralized, when denomination after denomination no longer exists under the authority of God's word, when the anointed people have left their skin and the anointing along with it, then the faithful, though we are no one, who have the ability to be filled with the Holy Spirit, to look intently into God's word, to understand it, to believe it, and to follow it, then then to whom much is given, much is demanded. And and I believe that the 12 apostles that existed at that time and the early church, that core, and, and probably many around them in layers as they would understand through time, understood that they had a huge responsibility before God that they had been massively blessed with this understanding and the manifestation of his presence. And and they probably looked around and they probably, they said, oh my gosh, we're it. We're it. If, If the Jews, if the Samaritans, if the entire ancient world is to ever find any salvation and peace with God and have any eternal life, then then we're it because we don't see anybody around us who knows what we know. And we know that we know what we know. And we don't know how we know it. We just know it's a mystery through Christ and his spirit. And so I believe that it was weighty. I believe the moment was ominous. I believe they were excited, but I believe they were terrified at the exact same time. And so I submit to you today, if that's how they felt, do you feel that way too? When you walk into a scene and you look around and you see that no one knows God, no one cares about God, no one ascribes to God's word, do you look for, to them for leadership or do you realize that subtly with love and grace, with, servant, with a servant heart as Jesus taught us, that you have a huge responsibility? to administer God's word, his love, his truth, and his spirit 
into that scene. Now these guys understood that though um, the rulers banded together against Jesus, that they really had no authority apart from God. They were not afraid of their authority. They knew that God's authority usurped their authority. They knew in a moment's notice, if God chose to, he could undo them. And they knew that if, even if they were allowed to do things, um, it was only being allowed um, by the sovereign plans of God. They went on to say they did. When they nailed Jesus to the cross, they did what your power and your will decided beforehand should happen. Uh, one time, Pilate, when Jesus was brought before him, he began to ask him questions, right? And he began to ask him questions to, to try to discern, uh, to ascertain if the charges brought against him by the, Jew, by the Jews were true. And the Jewish authorities arrested him and they handed him over to Pilate, who was a Roman leader, and, and they said, we want him crucified, get rid of him. And only the Romans had the ability to actually crucify somebody. Um, they did not have that level of authority with whatever civil authority the Romans had given them. And so Jesus was brought before Pilate and he began to ask him questions to see if the charges were true. He was giving him his day in court. And when he would ask a question, Jesus would just say something kind of short and clever. And sometimes he would ask questions and Jesus wouldn't answer at all. Jesus would not speak up for himself. He stood before his accuser. He could have had a powerful moment. He could have turned everything around. He could have been Pilate's best friend. He was quite charismatic. He was smart. He was intelligent. And this guy stood before him. And Pilate was typically um, probably used to when somebody stood before him, they'd made a case for themselves. They said, that's not true. Here's really the truth. And so he could not understand why Jesus would not make a case for himself. And Jesus would not make a case for himself because Jesus was basically there offering his life, surrendering his life to Pilate uh, in a sense to offer his life for all of us, right? It was part of God's plan. Scripture says that Jesus was a lamb slain before time. Before the world started, he knew that man who was created in God's image would sin and fall short of that glory from God and that apart from the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. The only way that you could shed the proper blood for humanity is to have perfect human blood and the incarnation of Jesus Christ. His father was God. He was conceived by the Holy Spirit and his mother who was Mary. His father was perfect and holy. His mother was flawed and broken just like we are. She was a wonderful woman, a faithful woman, a woman to even be revered, but not a woman to be worshipped. She was a woman. And, and, and being conceived in that way, he took a broken and flawed fre uh, flesh, and by the power and the internal fortitude of his spirit, which was the Holy Spirit through his father, he, he through suffering, perfected that body and offered that perfect body as a sacrifice for our sins. And, and this was the moment, this was the culmination of those events. So Pilate is questioning him, and Pilate finally said, don't you know that I have the authority to decide if you're going to be released or you're going to be crucified? Don't you know I can make it easy on you or I can kill you? And Jesus, the one thing he did say is he looked back at him and he said, you wouldn't have any authority if my father didn't give it to you. In other words, in a moment's notice, I, I could cause you to drop dead. But I'm not going to. Because this has been the plan all along. For me to be offered up, to die on the cross for the sins of humanity, to pour out my life on their behalf, to be rose, to raised from the dead so that they can spiritually immediately raise from the dead and one day when they die that they might rise from the dead, to ascend to heaven so that they can ascend to heaven and to go there to sit at the right hand of the Father to pour out my Holy Spirit upon the earth. All, that, all of that critical. And every little, you notice that in every passage we ever read, the virgin birth, the cross, the resurrection, the ascension, the dispension of the Holy Spirit, absolutely essential to every single thing we ever do or we ever say. It was essential, therefore, the Father and the Son and the Spirit knew in advance that this had to happen, and he was given over to it. So they understood that. And now they're about to respond. Uh, it's as if, and I'm reading between the lines. I know I'm projecting a lot today, but I feel like I have to. It's as if they, they have experienced Pentecost. They've seen thousands of people come into the church. They've witnessed miracles through their leaders and maybe even beyond. They've seen their little movement in days grow to thousands upon thousands upon thousands. They've seen their leaders put into the worst of circumstances and perform flawlessly, powerfully, just like Jesus 
would have performed. And it was as if up until this moment, they hadn't really put all together what was, it was happening so fast, they hadn't put it all together. And now they're having a moment, they're going, wait a minute. The authority of the kingdom of God has been placed upon and is coming through us. If there's any hope in the world, it's going to be God working through us. He's anointed us. He's blessed us. He's made us powerful. We see now what his plan is. We see now what he wants to do. And now we got to respond. And, and, and so I ask you, church, I ask you today, where are you? Uh, have you had that moment too? Uh, are you one of the least of these here who don't think you need to know God as much, who don't think your faithfulness and your devotion and having a surrendered and submitted heart, you think it's just the, you know, the leaders, the elders, maybe their spouses, maybe you don't have an important role here, you think you're too young, you think you're too poor, you think you're not smart enough. These guys weren't that smart either. They had a terrible education. Do you underestimate the importance of your devotion to the kingdom of God. The good news is that he will supply everything you lack. He will make you great. One, the only thing that we have to provide is a willing and surrendered heart, a hunger to be used by him to bring his kingdom to earth. So their response was this, and this is a, this is a wonderful prayer. I mean, this is, um, as I told you last week, if you have had a hard time getting God to respond to your prayers, pray like this. He'll respond. So here's their prayer. They said, now, Lord, in response, our reaction, consider the threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. They did not say, Lord, consider their threats and make us safe. They did not say, Lord, as King David would have said, kill my enemies. They did not say, Lord, get me out of this so that I'm not in danger anymore. They did not say, give us pleasure. They did not say, give us comfort. They did not say, give us more money. They did not say, bless me and make me so powerful that everybody will want you. They simply said, make us bold. They did not say, take the threat away. They did not say, make everything that's black, turn it to light. They, they actually, they loved it. They loved the drama. They loved the scene. They loved the thickening of the plot. They were like, leave it just as it is, but plant me in the middle of it and touch me and make me bold and make me great. Let my light shine more brightly because it is in darkness. Light never shines more brightly than when it's in darkness. If you put it out in daylight, you can't even see it. You make the room go black and the light, boom. It draws attention and everybody wants to see what's going on. Leave me in this place of being threatened. Leave me in this drama. Leave me in this difficulty. I will glorify you in my weakness so that it is clear that anything that is praiseworthy has been done through you. Make me bold. Make me great. Give me words. Give me your spirit. Fill me with force. Fill me with power. Glorify yourself through me, God. They went on to say, stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. Not for my glory, but for yours. All around me, Lord, as I'm, as I'm spraying out this fiery rhetoric, rhetoric, as I'm saying all these things and all these unimpeachable words, as I stand before a Sanhedrin, as I stand before an audience of unbelieving people, if I, as I stand before people who want to hear, as I stand before people who are hostile, and all these powerful words and this boldness and this courage flow out of me, at the same time do wonderful works, powerful works out of your loving kindness all around me so that people might know that this isn't just a guy who is eloquent. This is a man who is filled with the power of God. This is a manifestation of the kingdom of God. This is a coming of the kingdom on earth as it already is in heaven. That they will know that this is a moment of transcendence. That they will know this isn't something to go, gosh, that's a funny, clever guy. That they will know this is to the glory and the honor and the praise of the Father Yahweh and his son Jesus and is being done by the Spirit. Now, as I was reading this this week, and I, this, is, this is important. The other stuff's been really important, but this is even more important. I felt like the Lord saying, I will answer this prayer for your church. 
But you need to get them in the right place to ask it. They need to be in the same place and the same heart as the early church to experience the same response. And here's where I think they were. Now I'm projecting, I realize that. Don't crucify me because this does not exist in any of your commentaries. It's a living word provided by a living God who has his living Holy Spirit all around me, okay? But here's the heart I believe that they had as they approached God and asked for these things. I believe they were hungry. Jesus once said in the Sermon on the Mount, what did he say? He said, blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness. He did not say, blessed are they who strive and work hard and try to attain righteousness. Because that would be the same as saying, blessed are the self-righteous. We see they are not at all blessed. Jesus didn't like them very much. They had a name. They were called Pharisees and Sadducees and religious leaders. Not a very good thing to be. He said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, what we know to be true about the human condition, this is absolutely true. We know that each and every human being, man and woman, child, boy and girl, everyone created on earth, every human being, every race, every nation, no superior nation, every single person created on earth was created in the image of God. And what that means is, whether we know it or not, whether we have the wisdom or the understanding or not, we were created to contain, to reflect the glory of God. We were. We just were. It's why when we see something glorious happen in sports, uh, we break into a tear. It's why when Secretariat ran the perfect race and had this glorified moment, we all wept because when we saw that horse run so perfectly in our heart of hearts, we knew that we were supposed to be glorious too. When we saw a moment of almost transcendence and flawlessness, we had this sense that we were supposed to be that way too, which indeed we were. God made us. He made us good. He made us perfect. He made us image bearers. He gave us dominion. He gave us authority. We were to reflect his glory and and to assert his authority on earth as it is in heaven. We were just made to do that. You may not know it. You may know it. I don't know, but you were made for it. And, and, And whether you know it or not, and many of you maybe here do know it, When we don't have it, and apart from the blood of Jesus Christ and the filling of the Holy Spirit, we don't have it. When we don't have it, we feel empty, and we hunger for it. And we, don't, we can't always define it. We, we think, gosh, if I have more status, maybe that will fill my need for glory. We may not say it that way. Uh, maybe if I have the hottest girl or the hottest guy, that will fill my need uh, for whatever it is in me that is empty. Maybe if I have more cash, maybe if I have more pleasure, maybe if I have more pain and I'm gonna, and I run 10 marathons, I will feel glorious and this thing will be filled. I've ran 10 marathons and all I did is hurt. It doesn't work. And maybe if I do this, and maybe if I do that, and maybe if I have more of this, and maybe if I have more of that, I, I, will, I will be filled. But Jesus is saying, blessed are the hungry people, and we're all hungry, who have the wisdom, who have been given the knowledge by the Holy Spirit through the Scriptures as these men and women and all of us here today have been, to know that what we hunger for is righteousness, What we hunger for is a right relationship with God. What we hunger for is the glory of God, the spirit of God, the image of God to be reborn in us as we were created to contain. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for that. Now, Jesus didn't say blessed are those who strive for it, right? We just said that. You know why? Because you can't earn it. There's nothing you can do to earn the glory of God. There is nothing you can do to fill up the recesses of your heart. There is nothing you can do to make yourself bold in the face of threats, to speak God's word powerfully and eloquently and see signs and wonders all around you. Yet that's glory. You can't do it. You can't do it. You never, ever will be able to. But the good news is that Christ came to do it for you. To provide that through the washing in the blood, we are made holy, not by acts, but by faith. I believe, Jesus, that you died on the cross for my sins. I believe that your atonement, your washing in your blood, giving your life, the life is in the blood. You gave your life for my life, and in doing that, you made me holy. I'm still a work in process. I'm not quite there yet, but on a down payment, you've already begun to fill me with your glory again. 
your spirit, your life. And so I think these guys, they sat here and they heard about Peter and John and they saw the joy of the anointing emanating off of them. I think they had this wow moment where like, who are we that God would esteem us so much that he would make us know more than the people who are supposed to know more? And I think they hungered and they thirsted for that righteousness of what they had already begun to taste because we know most of them had already been baptized in the Holy Spirit. And they wanted more. It's the guy, it's the man, it's the woman who wakes up at 3 o'clock in the morning. And despite they have a great job and they got a great house, they got a beautiful wife, they got a beautiful life, they got beautiful kids, they got a beautiful husband, they got a decent tennis game. They had a great vacation. They have everything in the world they can want, but they wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and they say to themselves, I'm empty. They have this quiet desperation. But here's the grace of God. When he lands on that scene and he says, you know what you want? You don't want a better job. You don't want more money. You don't want sex, drugs, or rock and roll, even all at the same time. You don't want your college football team, as much as I want it, to be glorious. You want to be glorious. And he gives us the wisdom to say, what you want is glory. What you want is my image. What you want is my power. And that is most massively actualized, not simply, check this out, not simply by having this moment with God where we're filled with his Holy Spirit and he comforts us and he counsels us. That is one um, aspect of our salvation that is absolutely wonderful. But, but what he's saying is, you want me to lean down to touch you and to make you great. You want me to light you up. You want the anointing. That's what you want. Now, I know you think you want safety, ladies. But what you really want is a man that will lead you into harm's way for the glory of God, don't you? I know you think you want status and cash. Man, I am always wanting me some cash. But what I really want is the anointing of God. I want him to give me the power to glorify him, not myself. I mean, it's not about me. It's not even for me, yet it's everything to me, isn't it? Because it, I was created to contain the image of God. I was created to be great for him. And I want to do it again. I want to run that race for him again. And now that I've fallen in love with Jesus and I've seen everything that he has done for me, when I see that he has forgiven me in the past, he continues to forgive me in the present, he is showing me a bright future. I mean, not only do I want to be glorious for God, I want to do it unto his name. That is the heart that they are praying with. That is the place they were. I'm convinced that it is absolutely true. I don't know if they could have articulated it or not, but probably. And I say to you today, if we pray like they prayed that day, from that same place, with that same heart, we can accept, expect the same response. To be filled with the Spirit of God, to be anointed by God, to be given meaning uh, through God again, to be given the capacity for grace and love and compassion a righteousness that exceeds that of all the religious self-righteous people because it simply emanates out of us the ability to love God passionately and holy and because we love him and are filled with his love to love our neighbors as ourselves beginning with our spouse oh my gosh wouldn't that be great and our children and our families and those we work with spreading out to the whole world I mean this is the thing and so you might say well how do we get it we can't we don't strive for it it's just a gift well we surrender to it I mean, it is the pearl of great price, and though it costs you everything, I would recommend to you today to get it because it's really the only thing you want, whether you've defined it yet or not. And the one thing we provide is everything. We don't buy it, but we surrender to provide space for it because once we're filled with the Spirit of God and given over to the anointing of God, we got to go wherever it tells us to go. We got to do whatever it tells us to do. We got to say whatever it tells us to say. We got to spend whatever it tells us to spend. We got to be under His control. The Bible says those who are filled with the Spirit of God who are born again according to His Spirit are like the wind. You can hear it. You can hear it go by, but you can't tell where it came from or where it's going. So is the life of the anointed. And so if you want control and you want glory, you'll never have it. But if you can surrender control and know that everything you want in your deepest being is glory, then God will always, always answer that prayer. Scripture teaches us that if we pray anything according to the will of God, that he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, then we know that we have 
what we ask for. If we ask to be absolutely filled and saturated with the Spirit of God, utterly given over to his kingdom, portals of glory for him on earth, for the glory of his name, his son's name, and, 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 and just vessels of his passion and his love for others, you can be sure that that is a prayer that God will answer. It says, after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. An earthquake. Uh, commentators don't know if it was literal. I like to think it was. But it was certainly spiritual. In their being, they were shaken. It was a tectonic shift. It was a moment of enlightenment where everything changed. And here, what does it say? It says, they were all, all <laughs> filled with the Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, one guy would have been lifted up and the prophet would have came and said, this is the one God's anointing. Let's pray and do whatever he tells us. In this case, they were all anointed. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and all of them spoke the word of God boldly. They prophesied. They spoke words of knowledge. They, they said things they didn't know. They read scriptures and understood. They preached and they teach. They did all these wonderful... Wow! And when I tell you that that is what God has in mind for us, I believe it with all of my heart. If we will consecrate ourselves and set ourselves apart and give ourselves wholly to him, if we learn to define the, hungry, uh, the hunger and the emptiness that exists in our heart and we aim that at the throne of God through the sprinkling of the blood of the cross, then we will not be disappointed. We will absolutely be filled. And I don't care who you are or what you've done. I don't care what your issues are here today. Scripture teaches us very clearly how to deal with all the little problems in our life. Seek first the kingdom of God. Seek to see that kingdom and its authority come on earth as it is in heaven and make yourself a portal of it. Give yourself over to it. And all of these things will take care of themselves eventually somehow. And even in the midst of waiting, you will be filled with peace and joy beyond all understanding. Believe it or not, I'm giving you the silver bullet today. The remedy to whatever ails you, the remedy is the blood of Jesus Christ covering, the Holy Spirit filling, and you being utterly surrendered to it. That is the solution. That is the anointing. That is salvation actualized on earth, even before heaven. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, glory, praise, and honor to you. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for your spirit. We thank you so much for your grace. We praise you and thank you that you loved us so much that you didn't leave us over to ourselves and our own devices. You didn't leave us um, seeking and, and running around this world trying to devour everything that we could get our hands on to fill up the emptiness inside. You've come to us by the power of your spirit and your word and you have told us the truth. Jesus, you came from heaven to earth. You were born of the Virgin Mary. I say this prayer on behalf of my congregation uh, as an affirmation of our faith, confessing our faith. You died on the cross for our sins and your blood washes us clean. And every person in this room, I want to let you know, if you're praying that today along with me, if you're in agreement with my words, let my words be your words and this will be a reality. And you are filling us, dear God, with your Holy Spirit. You are saving us right now. You are saving us eternally for your kingdom and you are saving us temporally in our circumstances. You are saving us and you are absolutely sufficient. So we, in light of that, and this wonderful understanding that we have access to the ultimate authority directly to you, tethered to you by the Holy Spirit, right into your presence, standing at your throne right now with a clear conscience by your blood. We pray as the early church prayed, with all of our hearts, with a hungry heart, to consider the threats of the world we live in, the darkness that is all around us, and enable us, your servants, to speak your word with great boldness, to demonstrate your grace and your love with great boldness, to be unashamed of you, unashamed of our faith, to surrender our lives and everything we have for the glory of you, our King. We ask you to stretch out your hand and to heal and perform miraculous signs and wonders all around Monterey Church, dear God, everywhere around us. So they know that this isn't simply a house of fiery rhetoric. It is a house of power. It is a portal of transcendence. It is a manifestation of your kingdom on earth. Do that great thing through us, dear God. We surrender to it. And we do it all through and for the name of your holy servant our Savior and our King, Jesus Christ. It's in His name we pray.